Have you ever finished a game and felt shortchanged by certain plot points? Well, thanks to the beauty of expanded media, there's a strong chance that those plot points have been filled out somewhere else. As games become more and more narrative heavy, there's only so much story the devs can pack into their particular game. This gives plenty of opportunity for the story to be expanded further outside the game, and many studios have licensed all sorts of novels and comics and various other tie-ins to fill in the gaps. Of course, if you never read these things, and let's be honest, who wants to read when you can game I'm joking, you could just be left in the dark. Don't worry though, super nerds do exist, and the complicated world of expanded video game fiction is always fascinating to pick apart. All sorts of major video game plot points are resolved if you're willing to go a little bit further afield. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 video game plot points answered outside the games. But before we begin, I just want to quickly tell you about today's list sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. For those who don't know, Raid is a brand new RPG that is taking the mobile gaming world by storm. More than 10 million players have already downloaded the game in just three months, and it's easy to see why. There's an amazing storyline, loads of spectacular locations, PvP arena battles, over 400 champions to collect, and best of all, it's free. I mean, just check out the visuals and the details on those champions, and in Raid, you have the ability to customize and choose the artifacts for each one of them. Raid is getting rave reviews, and with over 300,000 player ratings, it has a near-perfect score on the Play Store. The game is growing super fast, and the highly anticipated new Faction Wars feature is now live. So, what are you waiting for? Go to the video description below, click on our special links, and if you're a new player, you will get 100,000 silver, 50 gems, one energy refill, and one free champion, the Executioner. Good luck, and I'll see you there. Number 10. How and why was Arkham City made? Batman Arkham City. There's a pretty hefty time jump in between the events of Rocksteady's Batman games, Batman Arkham Asylum, and Batman Arkham City. The sequel doesn't really do a great job of explaining why there's a massive super prison in the middle of the city, so along comes expanded media to fill in the gaps. To tie in with the sequel's release, Rocksteady and DC Comics released a comic entitled Batman Arkham City. This was designed to fill in the blanks between the games and was penned by legendary comics writer Paul Dini, writer of the legendary Batman the Animated Series. So at the end of Asylum, the Joker injected himself with a huge amount of Titan formula, destroying a significant part of the Asylum itself. This meant that there was absolutely no place for Batman's dangerous supervillains to be housed. In the confusion surrounding the evening, Quincy Sharp, warden of Arkham Asylum, takes the credit for Batman's actions and becomes mayor of Gotham. Turns out though that Sharp is manipulating the people all along, using the public's anger to declare martial law and give himself complete control of the city. He then begins the process of warding off a significant portion of Gotham to create Arkham City, and the next game setting is born. Number 9. Why was Marcus Phoenix a prisoner? Gears of War in between hugging those handily placed chest-high walls, hammer of dawning massive monsters, and dodging bits of darkness to avoid Krill, Gears of War, the original game, left a lingering question. Why the hell was protagonist Marcus Phoenix in prison at the very beginning? Gears is one of those series that has been expanded massively through both novels and comics, telling a wide variety of stories that happen outside the main scope of the games. In this case, to answer this question, we need to look at tie-in novel Gears of War, The Slab. Because here we find out that Marcus, 10 years after the Locust Emergence Day, abandoned his post in a bid to rescue his father, Adam Phoenix. The storyline also reveals how Adam Phoenix came to work alongside Locust Queen Mira, his research into the condition known as Lambency, and his desire to reveal his connection with the Locust to son Marcus. The book centers around the conflict of Aphira, humanity's last stronghold against the Locust Horde. The Locust have already killed billions and it's up to cog troops like Marcus to save the day, fighting forever against seemingly unsurmountable odds. It's here where the question is answered, as for abandoning his post, Marcus is sentenced to 40 years in prison. It's only when the Locust return that Dom finally comes and busts him back out, interrupting his sentence and setting the game in motion. Number 8. How was Rapture created? Bioshock. Although Bioshock, Bioshock 2, and Bioshock Infinite are packed full of lore detailing a great deal of what Rapture is, what it stands for, and why it was made, there's always been the question. Just how the hell did anyone build a city at the bottom of the ocean? Well, turns out tie-in novel Bioshock Rapture has the answers. At the start of this book, Andrew Ryan, the man behind Rapture, is horrified at the nuclear bombings at the end of World War II. He reveals that he's been working on a project in secret to escape from impending atomic war, a city removed from society, where there's no threat of nuclear attack. It's revealed that Ryan is a highly successful businessman, 
and he's using his vast wealth, contacts, and prefabricated buildings on ships to construct Rapture out at sea, all away from prying eyes or interruptions. The storyline then shifts to fill in the blanks of Rapture's civil war in the coming years, with regular time jumps taking us through the events up to Bioshock, then its prequel, Bioshock 2. Number 7. How did Saren fall to the Reaper Sovereign? Mass Effect. With Anthem leaving such a sour taste in the mouth of so many, it's hard to think of Bioware being a narrative juggernaut and delivering a game series with such expansive lore as Mass Effect, but I swear at one point it did happen. Back in 2007, Mass Effect introduced us to primary antagonist Saren. A Turian Spectre, essentially a specialist agent sent to do the dirty work for the big old Citadel Council, Saren fell from grace after he found what appeared to be an ancient starship and took it for his own purposes. This is all revealed in the game itself, but it's the Mass Effect tie-in novel revelation that reveals the actual story behind Saren and further expands upon the lore already established in the original game. The novel focuses not only on Saren's story, but also further expands the history of the Citadel Council. Alongside its internal warring, the galaxy's views on artificial intelligence, including the Geth, and it introduces characters to the series like David Anderson and Kaylee Sanders. For example, did you know that Saren betrays Anderson and stops him from being the first human Spectre? Put that in a future Mass Effect game. Number 6. What was that purple stuff in Chemical Plant Zone? Sonic the Hedgehog 2. No, it's not as big as a character motivation or whatever, but we might as well give a name to that stuff that keeps killing everyone in Chemical Plant Zone. Because if you've played Sonic 2 and you've been underwater as that sound effect kicks in, you've felt the fear. Back to the mysterious purple goop though, as it's actually called Mega Mac. First mentioned in the Western release of Sonic 2's game manual, in Sonic the Comic, which was totally the best thing to read growing up, that reveals that Mega Mac was originally created by Dr. Robotnik alongside an unnamed scientist helper, with its purpose being to kill Sonic. Well, mission most definitely accomplished, but in the comic this stuff would lead to Robotnik's helper being killed and bonding with the substance itself, creating a giant beast called Megatox. To be honest though, I can't tell what I'd rather try and escape. Number 5. How did Hatham Kenway become a Templar? Assassin's Creed 3. After a sizable rework and remaster in 2019, I'll totally say that Assassin's Creed 3 is finally genuinely recommendable. But still, its opening twist with assumed assassin Hatham Kenway actually being a Templar was always the stuff of legend. Now, if you've played Assassin's Creed Black Flag, you'll know that Hatham is the son of Edward Kenway, pirate and member of the Assassins. So, how did Hatham become a Templar? The tie-in novel to Assassin's Creed 3, Assassin's Creed Forsaken, spells this out. Told from the perspective of Hatham through his journals, the novel reveals that Edward Kenway was killed around Hatham's 10th birthday. Despite being in the Assassin's Order, Edward knew of a Templar named Birch, who he shared a mutual respect with. Birch then takes Hatham under his wing, with Hatham having no idea that Birch is in fact a member of the Templar Order. Fueled by a desire for revenge and to rescue his missing sister, Hatham is slowly molded into a Templar. The novel then further expands on what happened to Hatham in the build-up to Assassin's Creed 3 before going through the story beats of the game, but this time from Hatham's perspective. All of this kind of makes Hatham Assassin's Creed's revolver ocelot, and I am all for that. Number 4. The Series Timeline The Legend of Zelda the Legend of Zelda is a sprawling series filled with countless games to enjoy, minus Zelda 2, just ignore that one, but understanding the series timeline has always been pretty damn difficult. Most games in the series are usually set in some sort of self-contained universe, with some exceptions like Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask. The games are even set in completely different time periods, spanning history itself. Now, the overall timeline has long been debated among Zelda fans, as with every new game, everyone wonders just where it's going to slot into the overall canon. Finally, after years of waiting, the answers came in the extensive Hyrule Historia book. Inside the book, Nintendo finally gifted us with a full official Zelda timeline, finally giving context to the whole series. Turns out it all begins with Skyward Sword, which is currently still the very first game chronologically in the timeline. Although yet to be officially confirmed after release, most also believe that the most recent in the timeline is Breath of the Wild, at least due to its post-apocalyptic nature. Funnily enough though, as a way to just make sure that none of us are ever really comfortable with this stuff, the timeline as it's established still has branching paths, depending on what happened to Link at the time, implying that they might actually be a multiverse of all the Zeldas, which kind of means that they're all one, but also get to be separate. It kind of makes perfect sense and no sense at all. Number 3. What happened after the end of 10-2? Final Fantasy X slash 10-2. If you finished Final Fantasy X-2 with the best ending, you'll know what happens. If not, spoilers. 
Because at that game's end, after spending its duration searching for him, Yuna makes a deal with the Faith to restore Titus, who disappeared after the events of Final Fantasy X. However, what happens after that? Well, Kazushige Nojima, who penned the scenario for X and X2, filled in the blanks with a novel entitled Final Fantasy X-10-2, Ein no Daisho, translating as Price of Eternity. Although vague, the storyline goes through what happened to Titus and Yuna meeting on the beach of Besaid, up to the scene that you can unlock in X-2 if you achieve 100% completion. This additional story focuses on the redevelopment of Titus and Yuna's relationship. There are also time travel shenanigans involved, as the two end up on an island close to Besaid, but a thousand years in the past, because video games. And if you want even more Final Fantasy X fun, check out the audio drama Will, which further expands on both games' lore. Number 2. Who is the Elusive Man? Mass Effect 2 and 3. Sort of undoing his name a bit here, but step forward Mass Effect tie-in book Mass Effect Evolution. Here, one of the first things we learn is that the elusive man's name is Jack Harper. A former mercenary, Jack was involved in the contact war against the Turians, and was part of a group who captured a Turian general called Desilus. The plot revolves around a mysterious artifact that appears to have indoctrination effects. Saren, the antagonist from the first game, is a regular character too. As tension is still high between the Turians and the humans in the wake of the war, the novel highlights this throughout, with the Turians and Jack Jack regularly coming to blows over the artifact itself and what should be done with it. Evolution culminates with Desilus planning to use the artifact to create an army of super soldiers. Jack then struggles against this, manages to stop Desilus, and comes to the revelation that he needs to put humanity first. He then promises to watch the dark places and illuminate them, taking his place as the elusive man. I guess because the illuminating man just sounded dumb. And number one, where did the Church of Unitology and the Necromorphs come from? Dead Space. Tie-in novel Dead Space Martyr is the key to unlocking not only the secrets of the Necromorphs, but also the Church of Unitology. This mysterious church is referenced throughout the games and is mainly depicted as a crazy cult, responsible for creating the Necromorphs themselves. Dead Space Martyr details what happens to a geophysicist known as Michael Altman, who ultimately becomes the first person to discover the mysterious alien artifact known as the Marker. Immediately following this, people start acting strangely, with characters beating each other to death and some just willingly choking in space. Soon after, a cult around the marker starts to establish itself. This will in turn go on to become the Church of Unitology, but the leaders of this faction decide to alter history by killing Michael Altman, using the marker itself to create a new religious order for profit. They just leave out the bits about reanimated dead flesh. And that is my rundown of all sorts of video game plot points that were answered outside the video game. Let me know your favorites down in the comments below, and don't forget to check out the What Culture Gaming podcast. For now, I've been Scott from whatculture.com, and I'll catch you soon.